you so much for worshiping today. Uh, aren't you glad one day every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And we can bow the knee because we love him and uh, we can bow the knee because he loves us. And uh, so very thankful for that. Take the Bible you have today and turn to John chapter 14. Uh, the Gospel of Jesus Christ according to John chapter 14. And uh, either your physical Bible, which I hope you bring, or if you have a device you use, uh, your iPad, iPhone, or any other inferior device that you may carry. Oh, I, thought I only get one laugh out of that. Come on now. And... Uh, uh, John chapter 14, and uh, if you missed last week, we're jumping in uh, to a second part of a message we did last week on greater things, and uh, does anybody remember from last Sunday that we said Jesus is what? Greater. Oh, I think you knew better than that. Jesus is? Greater. Greater. We looked at John chapter 12, or Matthew chapter 12, and we saw that Jesus is is greater, and uh, and today we're going to continue uh, looking at our theme for the year, Greater Things, out of John 14. This is part two uh, of the series from last week. If Jesus, and, and, and he is, and if we saw that Jesus is greater, and, uh, and so today we're going to take the next step and look at the greater things uh, that Jesus talked about here out of John uh, chapter 14. Uh, now, we're going to look at verses 1 through 14 today, and, and, I, and I, I'm being serious. I, I really am going to talk fast, and if, if you listen fast and say a really, listen, if you say a lot of amens really loud, I'll even go faster. Amen. Thank you. Amen. And, uh, hey, and listen, I knew I'd get some shout going on today, and uh, get some excitement in here. And uh, But I, there, there are some things after the message I want to get to, some things that, uh, that God is just beginning to frame in my heart with our church, uh, being new here, and, and where does God want to take us? I want to share those with you, and, uh, and then over the next few weeks, actually probably a couple months, really target in on what we are, are praying about that God would have us do and be active at as a church uh, together in uh, our city, our county, our area. And so let's look at John chapter 14. Now, most of the time we go to John 14, we're talking about what typically? Jesus coming back, Jesus coming back heaven. And uh, we, we get all excited about heaven. Jesus is, we, we, we tend to lend ourselves to think that Jesus is trying to describe heaven to them. But it goes much deeper than that in John 14. And, and really John 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 are all taking place in a matter of a few hours. It's not like it's been weeks or days or days or weeks that this, this monologue that Jesus is giving with his disciples is happening literally hours before they head to the garden. And then hours that night before Jesus is taken uh, to head to the cross. And so Jesus is really getting in deep with them, fellas. He's, he's helping them. He's giving some understanding. He's enlightening them about things that are going to be happening at a very rapid pace. And he wants them to understand some truths that they need to know when he leaves them physically. And that's key, when he leaves them physically. So let's pick up in John 14, verse 1. We're going to read down through 14 and uh, follow along in your Bible this morning. Let not your hearts be troubled, Jesus is saying. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. <clears throat> if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him 
and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And the words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, this will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Go back to verse 12, if you would. Our, this is the text verse for where I pulled our theme for the year. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. So let's bow and make our prayer, and then we're going to jump into John 14 together this morning. Lord, what a wonderful, wonderful passage, and and Lord, if we have been in church any time, and, and maybe we have some folks today that are new to church, and, and I'm very thankful that they're here. But of those of us who may have been in church for a while, we're very familiar with John 14, and especially the first few verses about Jesus going and preparing a place for us. But Lord, I pray that our familiarity with the passage, with this portion of God's Word, would not rob us from what God wants to speak into our lives today. And so would you please, Holy Spirit, would you open our hearts, would you open our ears to hear, our, our hearts to receive, and may at the end of today, we not, may we not be afraid of obedience. May we yield and surrender ourselves to the great things that God wants to do in us and through us in the, to this year and the year to come. Years to come, we pray, and we love you. Amen. John 14, and I want to work real quickly through these verses with you together and then give you uh, some thoughts that I, I stuck there on the back of your bulletin if you happen to grab one uh, on the way in. And so I want to ask you a series of questions out of verse number one. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. So I want to ask you, what are you troubled about today? What are you afraid of today? What is it that is on your heart and on your mind that is troubling to you? Now, the reason I ask you that is because Jesus told his disciples not to be what? Not to be troubled. That would, that would, that would lend us to believe that maybe they had some problems going on. Maybe they had some things they were concerned about and troubled about in their life right now. Uh, but let me ask you this. Do you have any confidence in God? Do you have any confidence in God? Look at what he says in verse 1 again. Believe in God. Believe in God. Now, I find it just interesting that Jesus has been with these fellows three years. And here, hours before the cross, he's telling them, guys, don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. Number two, believe in me or believe in God. Obviously, there's some confidence, maybe struggles that they were having. And then number three, he says, do you believe or do you trust in me and who I am? I say I am. Look at what he says. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Three, the, the way he opens this up, it's, it's as if. He knows, and, I, and he does because he's, he's God, but he knows they're struggling. Can I say to you this morning, 2021, 2020, the world is a mess. We, we, we've talked enough about it, but here's the fact of the matter. God knows what you're troubled about. 
God knows that you, you have some struggles and you're having some challenges and maybe you're, maybe you're at a faith crisis and maybe you're having some doubts about God and what God is doing and what God's allowing and maybe circumstances are becoming overwhelming in your life and maybe you're making decisions you don't know what decisions to make and, and you're just overwhelmed and, and that overwhelm may be leading to maybe some discouragement or some depression and, and just life is overwhelming and Jesus... Notice this, hours before the cross, Jesus says to the guys, guys, don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in God. And also believe in me. Believe who I say I am. Can I ask you this morning, are you there? Are you in that kind of faith moment right now in your life? Look at verse 2 and following. In verses 2 through 4, Jesus, after he, he makes that opening statement here in a, in a new thought, in verses 2 through 4, Jesus uh, begins to declare what he's doing. He says, there is plenty of room for everyone where I'm going. As a matter of fact, I am going and I'm going to be working and I'm going to be making it possible. I'm going to make the way possible for you to be with me. And you know, I thought this was interesting. He says, you know the way I have to take to get there. He says, guys, there where I'm going, there's plenty of room for everybody. He says, and, I, and I'm, I'm working. I'm working to make it possible for everyone to go. And you know the way I have to go to get there. And look at verse 5. Thomas says, Lord, um, we don't know the way. We don't, we don't know what you're talking about. And how can we know the way? How can we know the road that you are talking about? And look at the, the verse that many of us have heard over the years. Jesus said to him in verse 6, I am what? The way. Eugene Peterson, longtime pastor in Maryland, said this about verse 6. He, he changes the word way there and uses the word road. Jesus says, I am the road. I'm the road. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the light. What is Jesus declaring for us in verses 6 and 7? He is declaring Thomas, the way to the Father, the way for you to be reunited back with Father, the way that you're going to get back to Creator God, to Elohim, to Jehovah, the way you're going to get to Him is not by a road that you make for yourself, but I have to take the road through the cross, through the death and the burial and the resurrection. That's the way. That's the truth. I am the life that you need. And look at verses 8 through 10. So he's, he's monologuing with them. And, uh, and he, he tells them in verse 7, if you, if you had known me, then you'd know the Father also. And in verse 8, Philip says, all right, Lord. And, and, and I find it interesting because many times we, we have these same kind of questions. All right, Jesus, I hear what you're saying, so do this. All right, Jesus, I hear what you're saying. Now, Philip says, all right, you say that if you've seen, uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. All right, Phil, here's what Philip says. Would you just plainly show us the Father? Would you just kind of make it a reality right now? Like, can you just kind of go, poof, and there's God, and we, we see him? Now, why, why would Philip, as a good Jew, be asking Jesus to show him the Father plainly? Because we know from the Old Testament, what does the Bible say? No man has what? Exactly. Seeing God. So every good Jew wants to what? See God. See God. So Philip just came out and said, now Lord, let's kind of put the cliches aside. Can you just make God appear? Boom. Just, just for a moment. Boom. Let's see him plainly. Now we laugh and we kind of go, yeah, Philip, he was kind of off. No, no, no. You know, we do the same thing. We say the same thing. God, if you would just do this, then I know you're for real. God, if you just do this, I know this is what you want. God, if you'll just put the car in the driveway. Right? If you'll just put the publisher's clearinghouse in the mailbox. Then I know, I believe that I need to give. 
I mean, we ask God to show some real things all the time, don't we? And that's what Philip is doing. He's just saying, Jesus, just make Father real right now. And look at Jesus' reply, verses 9 and 10. Jesus says, Philip, he's right here in front of me. He's right here in front of me. Everything you see, Philip, everything you have seen, everything you have experienced, and every word that you've heard me speak, they are Father. You've seen it. You don't need a visible, physical revelation of Father. Because if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Wow. Isn't that wonderful? I don't have to guess what Father's like. I don't have to guess what Father's doing. I don't have to think about how God's doing all. No, no. If you've seen Jesus, if you have Jesus, you have the Father. Then, look at verse 11 through 14. And Jesus makes a turn here. He tells them, in, beginning in verse 11, he says to them, now here's what I want you to do. As a result of you seeing me and hearing me and, and, and experiencing me, you've seen the Father. Here's what I want you to do in verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Here's what he's saying. I want you to put confidence in the fact that the Father and I are one. And then he does something very interesting. He says, but if you're struggling with that, if you're struggling believing that me and Father are one, then here's what I, I want you to do. Or else, verse 11, believe on the account of the works themselves. He says, if you guys are struggling with the words, with the, the testimony that I'm giving to you, that me and the Father are one, then what I want you to do is I want you to believe me for the because of the works, the very works that I have done through the Father. Believe me that I'm in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe on the account of the works themselves. If you're struggling with the words, then look at what I've done. So let me ask you, what did Jesus do? What are some of the things Jesus did? Well, he turned water to wine. He, uh, he helped uh, a man with a withered hand made whole. He, uh, he caused a blind man that lay, uh, 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 that was blind from birth in John 9, gave him sight. He, there was a man laying by the pool of Siloam who wanted to get in the water to be healed, but he couldn't. And Jesus healed him. Uh, there was a woman who had an issue of blood, wasted all her money on the doctors, healed her. What are some things Jesus has done to prove that he is God? And here's what Jesus says. Guys, if you're struggling with what I'm saying, then look at what I've done. And I want to tell you this morning, and let's all kind of be honest with ourselves, there are times we struggle with what Jesus says. Are you with me? We struggle with what Jesus says. And my challenge to you is look at what he's done. He has proven who he is. He has shown us what he's like. He has done what needed to be done. He has done the things that are impossible and because he says, guys, look at what I've done. If you see what I've done, then you can believe what I say. Amen. And then verse 12 is where I want to hone in on. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. All right, stop the bus. Now, Jesus, you're, you're, now you're really, you need to get it, you know, like that commercial. Jesus, you need a Snickers bar. <laughs> what do you mean we are going to do the works that you've done? You're not, now, Jesus, you're getting crazy here. But he takes it a step further. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to Father. Now, Here's what I want you to see this morning. That Jesus is preparing these men, both spiritually, mentally, and emotionally,
for what we would call, Watchman Nee actually called it, the normal Christian life. We read verse 12 and we tend to think that Jesus is talking about the extraordinary life. We're seeing Jesus, well Jesus is talking about that special group, pastors, missionaries, evangelists, they're going to do all the great big things. No, no, no. Jesus is preparing these 11 men. Judas is going to be gone. And so he's preparing these 11 men for what is going to be considered, what is going to be known as the normal Christian life. John Piper said it best in describing this. He says, this is the normal Christian life in verse 12. This is what it means to be a Christ follower. Believing on Jesus is what unites you to him for eternal life. And all that believe, Jesus says, will do works. And all believers will do works that Jesus did. The problem is, is what comes to mind when we think of Jesus' works. We automatically go to the miraculous. Is Jesus saying here that we are going to be doing the miraculous as well? And the answer to that is what? No. The works that Jesus is talking about here that the normal Christian life is going to have is not raising the dead. It's not healing the sick. It's not restoring the blind. It's not giving hearing uh, to the deaf and, and speech to the dumb. That's not what he's talking about. Then that brings us to the question and, and what I want to address for the rest of the message. What are these works that Jesus said that you and I are going to do? And even greater works, what are they? What is this normal Christian life? So if I had this morning to put my sermon in a sentence, it would be this. Anyone who is a believer in Jesus will do great things that will lead other people to faith in Jesus. Anyone who is a believer in Jesus will do great things that will lead other people to faith in Jesus. Now, let me, let me expand that for you. Number one, first and foremost, first and foremost, I must believe Jesus is who he says he is. That's where it starts for every one of us. We must believe that Jesus is who he says he is. That's what verses 1 through 6, Jesus is trying to describe. He's declaring who he is. And Jesus uses this word believe in verse 1 and follow. He uses it a number of times. Matter of fact, the gospel of John alone uses the word believe 99 times in his book. What is it to believe? It's, it's the word pistuo. It's, a, it's not a noun. It's a verb. It's something we do. It's, a, it's an action that we do. And the, the idea to believe is to be persuaded of. Or, or And the result of being persuaded means I put confidence in, to trust, to rely upon. If you're still there in John, turn a couple of pages to John 20. John chapter 20 and look at verse 31. John ends his work, his, his, his letter about believing. He uses this word believe again. He says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is what? That he's the Christ. That Jesus is, that you would believe, that you would have confidence in that you would rely on, that you would be persuaded that Jesus is who he says he is. Who did Jesus say he was? That he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John tells us, that's why I wrote what I wrote, so that you could believe. What do we need to believe about Christ? We need to believe that he is deity. That he is the Son of God. John, in verse 1, Jesus says, believe in God, believe also in me. John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, with God and the Word 
was God. That's his deity. That's who he is. Jesus is God. Verse 14 of John chapter 1. And we beheld his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Son. You can, you can write these down. John 10. Titus chapter 2. 1 John chapter 5. All of these speak of the evidence that Jesus was God in the flesh. He is deity. He is God. That's why in verse 7 he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And church, if you're going to be persuaded, if you're going to put your belief in Jesus Christ, part of that is knowing that Jesus is God. He is sinless. He's perfect. He's God. God in flesh. But not only that, not only do I need to believe it, in Jesus' deity. But secondly, I have to believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life with the Father. He tells us that in chapter 5, or verses 5 through 6 here in John 14. He tells Thomas, I am the road, I am the way. Go back if you're there in chapter 14. Flip back a few pages to John chapter 10. John chapter 10 and verse number 9. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. In Acts chapter, uh, in Acts chapter 4, in verse number 12, Jesus, uh, uh, Paul said, uh, Peter said, there is salvation in no one else. There is no other name other than Jesus, whereby men must be saved. 1 John chapter 5, 1 Peter 3, verse 18. All testify to the fact that the way that you and I get to Father is through Jesus. I have to put my confidence. I have to put my trust in, my reliance on Jesus if I'm going to get access, have access to the Father. And then thirdly, not only do I believe that Jesus is deity, not only do I have to believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life with the Father, but thirdly, I must make a definitive decision to believe Jesus and what he says. I don't know who said this, but someone has once said that salvation is the miracle of a moment. Is the miracle of a moment. And what, he, what they meant by that is this, is there has to be a definitive time in your life a day, a moment. I remember when I was a kid growing up in church, we used to sing this song. It was on a Monday. You ever heard that? You ever sing that in church? It was on a Monday when somebody touched me. And uh, then we go, it was a Tuesday and it was a Wednesday. And what you did was, is when we sang it in church, if you got saved on a Monday, everybody stood up who got saved on a Monday. And then they sat down and we went to Tuesday. And if you got saved on a Tuesday, you stood up. I remember, uh, I remember preachers when I was a kid get up and they would say, bless God, you need to write in front of your Bible the day, the hour you got saved. So you can always go back and remember the day, exact day you got saved. Well, I can tell you this. I don't know the exact date. Uh, when I got saved, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the time was that I got saved, but I can tell you this: I can take you to the office. I can show you where I bowed my head. I can show you where I put my faith and trust in Christ. And at that moment, at that day, as a ten-year-old boy, I know I trust and believe on Jesus. Amen. And I'm not saying you got to know the hour, the minute, the day, the the the, the calendar date. But there must be a time in your life that you can go back to and say, at that moment in time, I definitively called out and put my faith and belief on Jesus Christ Amen. to be my Savior. There has to be a moment, a definitive moment that happened in your life. And the first thing we need to understand that before we ever see great things happen, in our lives and around our lives is there has to be a time where we believe on Jesus who he says he is and what he says he's done. Can I ask you, are you persuaded as a result? Are you persuaded and as a result have you placed your complete confidence in what Jesus Christ 
has done for you? Have you received him as your Savior? That's first and foremost. Before any great things, that's the greatest thing you need in your life. Number two, Jesus doesn't stop there, but he goes on. He goes on in chapter 14. He brings us to verse 11 and 12, and he, and he says this, living, living the normal Christian life is every believer doing the works of Jesus. Now, now go back to chapter 14, because I, I, I really found, I found this fascinating. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Now, I'm thinking about what Jesus is saying here, and I'm reminded of, of my grandfather. Uh, the years that I remember him being alive, he had multiple jobs. But the one job that I knew that he had most of his life when I was alive was he worked for a, a Goodyear tire company. And, and many times my dad worked for him, my uncle worked for him. And, uh, but many times I would be with my grandfather when he would go change a tire. We would get a call, we'd go out to the truck stop on I-10, and the guy would have a flat tire. My grandfather would get in the truck. If he couldn't get a hold of somebody else to go, he would do it himself. He would drive out to the truck stop in Baldwin or drive out to the truck stop on 95 in Jacksonville, and he would get out to the, tr the tractor trailer and uh, begin to work. All right, He'd begin the work of taking the tire off the trailer or off the truck, take the tire off the rim, Put a new tire back on the rim, put it back on the truck so the truck could get going. And by the way, the one thing I didn't tell you, he only had one arm. One arm. Now, I don't know if you ever changed the tire on a semi. You don't do it with your little jack under your car. You just don't take the lug nut wrench and, you know, break the lug nuts. No, you got to take a jackhammer and put it, I mean, it's a big, long contraption. Put it up, and you, I mean, it, it vibrates like a jackhammer. You're breaking the lug nuts off. Then you got to break the rim off the tire. That means you got to, literally, you got to swing a sledgehammer with a point on it to break the tire from the rim. Then take two tools and pry that rim off that, that tire, put the rim back on, back on the truck, and he did it with one arm. And I, when I read this, I'm thinking, I couldn't do that with two arms, much less one, and do the work that I saw that man do. You know what? It's kind of the same way when I read this about Jesus. And Jesus says to us, you are going to do the works that I do. And I automatically think, Jesus, what are you talking about? I'm not raising the dead. I'm not healing the blind. I'm not healing those that have been sick for all their life. What do you mean that I'm going to be doing the works that you are doing? And, and there's two things we, we've got to look at, two words that are connected together. The word believe and the word works. So the normal, number one, the normal Christian life is believing what Jesus says. Go back to verse number 10. Do you not believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? And the words that I say to you, I do not speak them of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. So let me ask you this morning. You've got to follow along, all right? Did Jesus just say that the, the things that he has said, they come from his Father? Is that what he said? Is that what he said? Let me shake something out here. Something around. Yeah. All right. So everything Jesus said comes from the Father. So that means when Jesus is saying to them right now, you are going to do the same works that I do. Who is that coming from? The Father. It's coming from the Father. It's coming from the Father to you. So first and foremost, when we're looking at living this normal Christian life, we put our faith and trust in Jesus. And then Jesus tells us from the Father, believe what I'm telling you because these words come from the Father. That you are going to be doing the same works that I'm doing. But then he said this, you're going to struggle with what I say. I, I know you're going to struggle with it. It's going to be hard to get a hold of. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to look at the works that I've done. Look at the works I've done. Okay, let's look at the works. 
And he says, if you have a hard time believing what I'm saying, then would you at least believe what I'm saying based on what, watch this, Father has done what? Through me. What did Father do through Jesus? He did some great things, didn't he? He did some great works, didn't he? So Jesus says, if you're struggling with just the words, then believe me for the very works that the Father has accomplished, the works that you have seen Father do. Now, I want to take a divine time out right here. Time out. I think the reason we struggle with this is because in our generation, in our church life, we haven't seen God do a lot of great things. And so we struggle, we doubt. Is God doing any great things anymore? Can God do great things anymore? Can he? Yeah, save me. Yeah, absolutely. He can still do great things. Well, I guess he's just chosen not to do them anymore. I guess he's just left our churches and he's left the world. He's, he's just left us up to our own selves to, to do our own things. Watch this. To come up with our own plans and our own fixes. I guess God's just not doing any more great works. Is that a truth or a lie? We know it to be a lie, but here's, the, here's, here's where we struggle we know that to be alive, but we struggle with what Jesus says. Is he really going to do it? Can he really do it? We're struggling with it. And we look back and we see what he's done in the past. But can he do what he did in the past? Can he do great things now? We've got we to come to grips with Am I going to believe what Jesus says? Which brings me to my next point. That not only is the normal Christian life believing what Jesus says, but the normal Christian life is doing the works of Jesus. What are the works that Jesus accomplished? And we need not focus on the miraculous, but we need to focus on why he did what he did. Why did he heal? Why did he raise from the dead? Why did he bring... Why did he bring wholeness to those that were broken? And here's the work that Jesus did. Here's the work that Father did through Jesus. These are works or things that point people to faith. What was the point of the miracles? It was to point people to faith in Jesus. If you... Are a believer in Jesus. And that's what your life is. If you've accepted Christ. Then the things or the works. In your life. That God wants to do in you. And God wants to do through you. Are for the purpose. Of displaying. The trustworthiness of Jesus. Did you get that? The works that Jesus. Wants to do in you. And the works that he wants to do through you. Are for you. To help others see that Jesus is trustworthy. We mentioned this verse in our Bible study this morning. Matthew 5. So let your light so shine among men. That they may see what? Your good works and do what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. What is that saying? You're pointing people to the trustworthiness of Jesus. Here it is. The... Take the works of Jesus, put it together with the words of Jesus, and that leads people to believe. To believe. The works of Jesus function to lead people to faith in Jesus. Again, I like how Piper described it. He said, Jesus said, my works function to lead people to faith in me. In verse 11, then in verse 12, when you believe in me, I will work in you and your works like my works will lead people to faith in me. 
See, we get so hung up on the miracles that we miss the purpose of the miracles. The purpose of the miracles were not just because, wow, Jesus can do miracles. No, the purpose of the miracles, the purpose of the works that Father did through Jesus was to help bring people to faith, belief in Jesus. And the works that He wants you to do, He wants to do in your life and through your life are to help others bring people to to faith in Jesus. Now, obviously you want some evidence, right? How many of you want evidence? Alright, so go to uh, go to John chapter 10. Let's take these real quickly. John chapter 10, look at verse 25. John, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. John 10, 25. I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness what? About me. About me. What does the works do? Bear witness. bear witness. They bring people to belief in Jesus. Uh, go to uh, John chapter 13. John 13 verse 35. By this all people will know that you are what? My disciples, if you what? Have love one for another. So the way we love one another points people to who? Jesus. Uh, go to, uh, we just gave you Matthew 5. Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 near the end of the Bible. 1 Peter 2 and verse number 12. I get there myself. First Peter 2 12. He says, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good what? Deeds, Deeds and do what? Glorify God. Glorify God. So, what is the purpose of the works? The purpose of the works is to bring other people to belief, to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, if Jesus stopped right there, if he said that these particular works that he, we're going to do, we're going to do the works of Jesus, he's going to do them in my life and through my life so that others come to faith in Jesus. If that's where Jesus stopped, we could all say, wow, I'm going to be doing what Jesus did. But Jesus didn't stop there. He actually took it a step further, which is my last point today. Jesus promised, number three, Jesus promised that every believer can do greater things. He can do greater things. Now, doing the works of Jesus, wow, that's big stuff. But Jesus says, I'm going to take a step up. You're going to do greater things. Now, where does that leave us? What question does that leave us? How much greater things can you do than what Jesus did? Really? Was Jesus just kind of giving a pep rally here, trying to pump us up? Or was he actually telling the truth? Was he being real when he said greater things? I want to propose to you today that Jesus was being real. Greater things. You will do. Jesus said, I will do things that he did. And not just the things he did, but greater things. And he's not talking about greater miracles. He's not talking about the miraculous again. He's talking about greater things. What makes them greater? What would make it greater? Well, would you put yourself right here in John 14? Would you be, would you place your, in your mind's eye, put yourself in John 14? Has Jesus been to the cross yet? In John 14. So everything that Jesus has said up to this point 
is a promise leading to what? To the cross. Guys, I'm telling you where we're going. Everything is pointing. Everything is leading. It's a promise to the cross. Now, let's look at us. Are we before the cross or are we after the cross? We're after the cross. Are we telling people what Jesus is going to do someday? Or are we telling people what Jesus did do? Are we telling people that, hey, one day Jesus is going to come and die? Or are we telling people, no, Jesus came and he did die, but he also he rode the third day? Do you see, you see where I'm going with this? What makes what we do greater than what Jesus did? Because when Jesus was physically on the earth, he was still pointing people to the cross. Now he's at the right hand of the Father. What are we doing? We're saying he came, he lived, he died, but he rose again. And he's proven himself to be God and he can change your life. Amen. And we can see greater things done, not because we're greater, it's because Jesus has given evidence he is greater. He has done what no one else has done. He has conquered death, hell, and the grave. And now that we're on this side of the cross and we've experienced the resurrecting power, the forgiveness of Jesus after what he did on the cross, I can now say, if he changed me, Gary, like you just said, he can change you. If he can save me, he can save you. If he can forgive me, he can forgive you. Amen. And we can point people to what he's already done. That's great. That's greater. That's what makes what we have greater. Because we already have a crucified Savior. We already have a risen Savior. We already have a reigning Savior. And we already have an indwelling Savior. Now notice real quickly, and I'm done. Notice what he said. Is the key for you and I doing these greater things. He gives us three keys. Number one, the key to Jesus doing greater things is Jesus' proximity to the Father. Look at what he says back in verse 12. And greater works than these will he do because what? I'm going to the Father. Where is Jesus right now? Jesus is with who? The Father. Now when Jesus is on earth, whose works was Jesus doing? The Father. When Jesus is on earth, whose words were Jesus giving? The Father. Now Jesus is with who? The Father. He is at the right hand, the Bible says, of the Father ever interceding for us. Jesus in Romans chapter 8 and verse 34 says he is there with Father on our behalf, pleading on our behalf that we would do and have the power and the work in us to do the greater things that he wants us to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have someone on my behalf. We have Calvary. We have someone on our behalf pleading to the Father for us. That gives us the confidence that we can do greater things. We can see greater things done. Number two, not only that, but we have Jesus' promise of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The reason we can do greater things is because now not 12 guys have Jesus physically with them. Now every believer has Jesus living in them. So everywhere I go, guess who goes with me? Everything I do, guess who's with me? Jesus. It's just not someone doing miracles all by himself that I'm just are surrounded as we read through the Gospels. No, Jesus says, I'm going to send my promise, the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit. And not only will he be with you, but he will be in you. And Acts 1 tells us, and after that, ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the most. I have the eternal life and presence of Jesus permanently 
in me. And the last key to doing greater things is not just because Jesus is proximity to the Father. He's pleading on my behalf. He's cheering me on. I have his indwelling spirit. But thirdly, in verses 13 and 14, Jesus' power is displayed through prayer. Look at what Jesus said after he said that. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That doesn't mean that after we're done today, you go home and say, in the name of Jesus, Publishers Clearing House in my mailbox. In the name of Jesus, a new car in my driveway. It's not what he's saying. All right? So let's, 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 be, let's be good students of the Bible, okay? He just got done in verse 12 talking about what? You're going to do what? Greater things. Greater things. You're going to do, do the work that I do, and you're going to even do greater things than I did. And then the very next verse connects what to verse 12? Prayer. And if you ask anything in my name, what do you think Jesus is talking about? If I ask him about what? Greater things. If I ask anything to Jesus of how my life can help others come to Jesus, Jesus says, if you ask anything that helps you bring others to me, that, you, that helps others have faith in me. If you ask anything in my name about that, here's what Jesus says, I'll do it. I'll do it. Now, can I, and, and this is going to sound really crazy. But what if we as a church begin to pray like this? Lord, we want to get the gospel into every home. In Lancaster County. Sorry. Lancaster. <laughs> All right. Let me say it right. He may be thinking about California if I told Jesus that. All right. Lancaster County. Lord, we, we want to get the gospel into every home. We want people in every home to have the opportunity to believe on you. So Jesus... Will you, in your name, the name that it was died and buried and rose again and forgives all men, would you, in Jesus' name, give us the power, the means, the workers, the labors, the method to how to do that? According to verse 13 and 14, what did Jesus say he'd do? He would do it. So let's bring this all for full circle. It brings us all the way back to verse 1. Do we believe who Jesus is? And do we believe what Jesus is? See, church, there has to come a moment in time that either we believe Jesus or we don't. We believe we'll do what he did and greater things or we won't. We believe that if we ask anything that enables us to get the gospel to people who don't have it, that he will give us the means, the methods, the labors, the money, whatever we need to do it, he'll give it or he won't. Do you believe? Do you believe? And so if we truly believe that, here's what's going to happen. My beliefs determine my behavior. My beliefs determine my behavior. If I believe it, then I'm going to start behaving differently. That means I'm going to start doing differently. And I'm going to start living my life in such a way that I believe Jesus is going through me, in me, and through me. He is going to do great things to help bring others to belief in Jesus. That's what John is saying. That's what Jesus is showing them, guys. Guys, I'm going away. I'm in just a few hours. I'm going to be leaving. And I want you not to be troubled. I don't want you to doubt. I don't want you to be confused. But you are going to continue to do the things we're doing and even greater things after I go to the cross. After I go to the Father, you are going to do some great things.
And wouldn't you know it? Wouldn't you know it? Forty days later, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 2, 40 days later, Acts chapter 2, Peter gets up and preaches. Thousands come to belief on Jesus. Thousands. Forty more days after that, another message. Thousands come to faith in Jesus. Three years after that, the church is in Samaria. Seven years after that, the church is in Judea. Thirteen years after that, Paul is preaching the gospel to the ends of the earth. Jesus never made it out of Israel. Greater works than these shall you do. Do we believe that? Do we believe it? If we believe it, let's begin to behave like we believe it. And live like what Jesus says is true. Amen? Amen. Let me give you a couple things and we'll, we'll be done. So, what, um, that's kind of, I don't know if you can see that very well. I tried to proportion it. So, after, after this message here, what, what I've been doing, what I've been praying through and trying to, to get the mind of the Lord on is what, what, does, what does those greater things look like? And, and what I want to show you is, is not permanent. It's not uh, necessarily extensive yet. But I, I want to give you a frame. And, and if you can't tell what that is, that's a picture frame up there. And it's uh, four squares, four, four windows of a, of a window pane. And, uh, and this is kind of the framework that I, I'm beginning to look at it and what I believe Jesus may be leading us to, the things that, that Jesus is leading us to do. And the frame is really the vision. What, what is the vision of what God wants us to be as a church? And our vision is to see every person deeply transformed through a personal relationship with Jesus and lead others to experience the same. That, that is what our purpose is. That's what Jesus desires for us. A vision is what you want to see in the future. In the future, we want to see every person in our area Deeply transformed through a personal relationship with Jesus. Would you agree with that? Is that what I, is that what we're here for? Yes, exactly. And to lead others to experience the same. And so what that is, I took that frame and, and I framed up uh, where we can begin, a starting point where we can begin to work to that end. And uh, I'm going to go through these four window frames with you real quickly. And so, number one is mission. So vision, when we use the word vision, it's what the foreseeable future is. This is what we want. This is where we're working to get towards. Our mission is a clarifying statement of how do we get there? How do we get to the vision? And the way we get to the vision is that we want to be a community. And notice I underlined these two lines here because these are action verbs. These are not things that we just say, we, we, we just kind of wait to happen. No, we are actively, we want to be a community for all people to discover the transforming life of Jesus. We want to be a church. We want to be a community of people. Now, a community is made up of how, how is a community of one type of people or all kinds of people? We want a community, we want all kinds of people. It doesn't matter their ethnic, social, uh, economic. Uh, it doesn't matter their ethnicity. It doesn't matter where they come from. Uh, if, they, if they come, listen. Now, the Willow Street people, <laughs> we'll let you in, but we're going to keep an eye on you, okay? But other than that, just joking. Other than that, we want to be a community for all people. We want to welcome everyone. Everyone is welcome. 80 to 2 years old to cradle. We don't care. Everyone is welcome. For them to discover the transforming life of Jesus. Now, that's what we do. That's, who, that's what we're doing. Now, what does that mean? That means here's why we want to be that kind of community. This is our motive. Why do we want to be a community of people that see them transformed? Because we believe that 
everyone should have a deep spirituality. Meaning this, everyone has their own personal relationship with Jesus. Everyone, not, you're, not, you're not living off my relationship with Jesus. You're not living off your spouse's relationship. You're not living off mom and dad's relationship. You have a deeply formed spiritual life for yourself. And learning and growing in that personal relationship with Jesus. Number two, another motive is we believe, we should believe in healthy relationships. And now you've heard me talk about this. Listen, we're all a mess in here. We're a mess. We all have problems. We're a mess. And how we have relationship with one another, how we share life and do life with one another needs to be healthy and spiritual. And you and I have to work. We have to grow in that. Number three, we need to be extravagant, have extravagant generosity. In other words, we need to, be, we need to have a giving heart. We need to be a giving people, people that give to help others, to help with the gospel. And then we, uh, one of our motives is the mission of Jesus. That is getting the gospel out to our area into the world. That's our motive. This is why we do what we do. This is why we want to be a community that sees, for everyone that sees people's lives transform. We see the arrow. So the mission goes to the motive. And then the motive comes to, here's the map. How do we get there? Well, we come together. We come together. So let me ask you, when do we come together as a church? When do we come together? Sundays. When else do we come together? Wednesdays. Wednesdays. When else do we come together? Men's connect groups. Connect groups. Anything else? Men's. Men's groups. What else? ABF. Adult Bible Fellowships. Children's Ministries. These times we, we come together. How are we going to be formed spiritually? How are we going to work on relationships? How are we going to be extravagant in our generosity? How are we going to do the mission of God? We've got to do what? We've got to come together. Then we do what? After we come together, what do we want to work on? We want to work on growing together. Here's a proven fact. Your spiritual life grows in the company of others. You best grow with others. If you have an individualistic spirituality, meaning I, I just think my spiritual life is personal, then you are going to hit a stunt in your growth. Jesus had three. Jesus had 12. Jesus had 40. End up 120. And it kept growing after that. Why? Because growth takes place better together. And then thirdly, we go together. We go. That means we're, we're going to be active together as a church. It's not the pastor's job. It's not Pastor Gary's job. It's, it's not the deacon's job. No, we all do what together? We all go together. We do ministry together outside of these four walls. And then we serve inside these walls. We serve together. We serve others. We meet the needs of others. And care for others. So our mission goes to our motive. Then once we know what our motive was, we need a map of how we're going to get there. And that leads me to my last point. And these are these are just some, some ideas. I've talked to the deacons about some of these. I've talked to uh, PG about some of these. These are our marks. This is, this is kind of what putting feet to what you see, putting the rubber to the road. And uh, number one, we want to be a church that worships not just on Sunday, but a church that worships Daily, Meaning this, when I come Sunday, I want to share what happens in my life on Sunday with others on Monday. I don't want to keep my spiritual life just on Sunday. I want to worship daily. I want to bring others in to worshiping Jesus. And so I'm going to share what Jesus has done in my life today. I'm going to take it to somebody else and share it with them. So I'm learning to, to worship daily. And then I'm going to talk about this for the next few weeks. We're going to start an intentional focus on prayer. Specifics. We're doing some specific things about praying. Now, tonight we're supposed to have a prayer time. But because of the snow, we're going to put that off. We won't have that tonight. But we're going to have targeted, intentional times where we as a church collectively come and pray together. Amen. Because we need the power of God. We need, listen, I, you don't need any more fancy programming from me. No, we need God. Right. If we're going to do the greater works, then who do we need to do the greater works? Ask in my name. 
and I'll do it. So a targeted focus on prayer. Number two, uh, multi-level discipleship. And I told you before I came, my wife and I are intentional about this. We believe this is the key to the Christian life is discipleship. And we are going to focus on multi-level discipleship at every level. Uh, children's ministries, we're going to be having a meeting in a couple weeks uh, with those that are working and desire to work. Uh, we'd like to start a water program on midweek for our children here at the church. Student ministries, uh, I need you to pray with me. Uh, we had a couple guys that we uh, were thinking about coming to check us out. And uh, one of those guys backed out. One of the guys is still considering coming after he graduates. But we need somebody to lead our youth, uh, our students. And uh, we need something for young adults. When they get out of high school, what's the next step? And uh, that would be young adult life and, and providing something for young adult life. And then adult ministries. Uh, we're talking about uh, re uh, refocusing our adult Bible fellowship at 930 and possibly birthing some new classes where it's just not one class, but multiple classes that people can have a choice to go to. I'm going to skip discipleship group life. Uh, we had a meeting with our group leaders last week. We had one of the, even despite COVID, we had one of the great, greatest years in our group life that we've had this past year. And now we're talking about, we have such, we have over a 60% attendance rate in our group life. That now we're talking about expanding and starting some more groups where more people can come and be and get connected. And so in group life. Uh, and so discipleship. Um, next Sunday, I'm going to be asking you uh, to sign up. We're going to start our discipleship, I believe, in March. And uh, it's going to be on Wednesday nights. Uh, but if you can't make Wednesday night. If uh, you don't like driving at night, uh, here's what I'm praying about doing. I'm going to start one at Wednesdays at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So if you can't make Wednesday night discipleship, you have an opportunity to make it at 1 o'clock if you don't like driving at night. And we may, and we're praying, may have something on a Saturday depending on how not being stretched out too thin. But uh, we want everybody to have the opportunity to begin to grow in their discipleship uh, with Jesus. And, uh, and there's different levels of that, and uh, I'll talk to you more about that. Uh, the next mark is community impact. We have got to impact the community. We've got to get outside the walls. And so this coming four weeks, I'm going to present to you what Pray and Go is. And I'll talk more about that. Uh, Calvary Cares. Calvary Cares is going to be things that we can do as a church to show our community that we care about them. Uh, it, it, raking somebody's leaves, put you know, partnering with a food uh, a food truck to, to distribute food, something to show our community, hey, we care about what you're going through in your life. Uh, that could be also uh, by means of doing kind of a grief share, uh, cancer ministry, uh, different things that just give opportunity for our community to know that we care about them. Uh, we want to improve our guest services. That means we want, when people drive on the property, we want them to know what is the next steps. Where do I go? You need to sign. Where do we go? If I pull on your property, where do I go? How do I get into your building? Once I get into your building, what do I do? And uh, who am I meeting? Who am I, where, where am I sitting? And who, what do I, where's the bathrooms at? And, and all those things. And, and I don't know about you, but when I go into a store, one of the things I'm looking for, where's the bathroom sign? Amen. Amen. That's right. <laughs> all right. And so, uh, you know, you, you, when you go somewhere, you want to you want to be aware. Uh, and after the service, uh, we want to provide people a, 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 a place that after the service, what do I do next? If I if I like Calvary, I want to know more about Calvary. What do I do next? And so we want to improve our our next our guest services and our next steps, which is on ramping people into church life. And then lastly, serving others, serving others. That's what the Christian life's about. Others. Jesus said we're to think of others better than ourselves. And what that takes is we all have to make a commitment to participate. And what I mean by that is this. I'm not saying you have to be a lifer at one thing. We, have, we, we got a bad rap about that back in the day. If you signed up to be a third grade teacher, bless God, you were a third grade teacher until you died. <laughs> How many remember those days? Some of you did that. <laughs> I'm not talking about it, but everyone. Everyone should be committed to do something. If you're a member of this church, you're a part of the body. 
That means we cannot function without you. And God has a place for you to be committed to participate. Secondly, we have got to learn again how to practice empathy. Not sympathy. Empathy. Meaning we need to be open to the hurts and the cares and the struggles of others. And we just don't pat them on the head or pat them on the back and say, I'm praying for you. But we get involved in this life and help them on their journey. And then thirdly, we got to be committed to grow. I don't know about you, but I'm still growing. I don't mean out either. Maybe some, but I, I'm growing spiritually. And we've got to commit that you, we haven't arrived. There's still room in my life to grow spiritually. And serving in a church means, you know what, I need to take that next step of growth. He said, well, Pastor, all I've ever done is greet somebody at the door. Well, you know what? Maybe it's time for that next step of growth. What's the next step Jesus has for you in the church? Well, Pastor, I've never helped in children, children before. Okay, well, maybe it's time to start. Take the next step. Those kids scare me half to death. No kidding. They scare their own parents. <laughs> Take the next step of growth. Well, I've never done discipleship. What if I don't know all the answers? It's okay. Take the next step of growth. Be willing to grow. Hey, listen, I, I'm not saying I'm not saying these are the answer to everything, okay? Here's what I am saying. We gotta start somewhere. We gotta start somewhere. And here's a framework. And I'm telling you, over the over the next months, the next year, the next years, we'll adjust this and we'll make changes to it and we'll Make it better and we'll remove some things and add some things until we get to where Jesus wants us to be and doing what Jesus wants us to do so that, watch, we can do the greater things that he wants us to do. Amen. You with me? Yep. Yeah. Amen. Hey, let's pray together. Lord, I don't, I don't know where... Everyone is in their spiritual life and their spiritual journey. There may be some folks here that uh, don't know you as Savior and they need to start a, relate, a personal relationship with you. And there may be some here today that they've been on a journey with you for a short time or maybe a long time. Lord, there are many that have been members of the church here a long time. And there's many here that have been members a short time. But none of that really matters in the sense of that makes anyone less important than the other. All of us are valuable to you. And Lord, if someone needs to believe on you as Savior today, then they can, they can get that, they can make that decision and, and make that happen today. And we would love to talk to them about that. If someone's been on this journey a long time with you and they've trusted Christ, they, they had that moment and wherever they are in their journey, they, there's some still room in their life to grow. Lord, you still have Calvary Baptist Church here in, in this area, in this street, in this neighborhood, in this town for a, for a reason and a purpose. And, and Lord, there's still something you want to do with us. And Lord, we're not saying we've got all the answers and we're not saying that this is a perfect plan. But here's, our, we are, here's what we are saying, Lord. God, we believe. We believe that you want to do great things. And Lord, it may be next year you flush this whole thing down the toilet. We start over again. I, I don't know. But Lord, I do know this is I, I want to believe you to do something in my life. I want to believe you to do something in my wife's life, in my boy's life, in our church's life. Lord, I, I was thinking about this week and the fact that the reason that the, there's a book of Judges in the Bible is because there was a generation that grew up not knowing the God of our Father. And Lord, today we have a generation of people that do not know the God of the great things. And so, Lord, help us. Would you enable us in the name of Jesus to be a church? Would you give us the things and provide the, the, the leadership in our church and the means and, the, and the, the money and the method for us to be a church, not to grow bigger buildings, not to become fancier in our presentations, but Lord, help us 
to have those things so that we can bring others to faith in Christ. Lord, put us on mission with you. We believe you can, and we believe you will do it in the name of Jesus. And we love you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hey, a couple things before you go.